All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Bright Founders Talk at Temi. Temi is an international software development company that designs, builds, and delivers software for sustainable businesses and promising startups. My name is Matthew, and I'm joined today by Jamie Kalon, who is the founder of Regulator and 54 Blue. How are you today, Jamie? I'm amazing, thank you. And it's nice to reach across the ocean and have a, uh, a nice little conversation with you. Fantastic. We're on two different time zones today. Early morning for you, late afternoon for me, but I'm sure we're going to make this work. Jamie, before we get into it, can you give us a brief overview of Regulator and 54 Blue and who are you? I am uh, the founder of both companies. 54 Blue is a very specific style of marketing agency. We are what would be considered a trade marketing agency. So Anything that the consumer feels and touches uh, at the retail, traditionally brick and mortar, uh, is where we operate. And we do that for some fairly marquee brands in North America. We we run all of Oakley, uh, the sunglass company's trade marketing in North America. Uh, we do North Face. We do a whole bunch of stuff for Monster Energy, you know, a bunch of different companies like that. But our specialty um, is anywhere the consumer interacts with the product. And for, you know, for Oakley, it might just be where the eyewear is all the way through to, you know, like we helped uh, design and do the consumer interaction for the Whistler Oakley store at that, you know, very famous uh, mountain resort. So well, we kind of tackle everything from sometimes making little stickers all the way through to designing entire consumer interaction. Uh, and that is both on the digital and um, actual physical side. So that's what 54 Blue does. Uh, Regulator is the back end that helps us years and years ago. So little backstory on me. I was uh, a professional athlete for Oakley. Actually, I was a cyclist, um, multiple sort of national champion in Canada on track, road and mountain biking. Uh, after my career was done, I did a bunch of invention in the world of mountain bikes. So I've sort of got myself this little taste of inventing and building things and building product, which I absolutely loved. Um, you have a patent, sorry to interrupt you. You have a, 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 paint, a patent, don't you, on um, on a system that creates an S-bend in the wheel? Am I, am I on the right track? Yeah, that's actually very good. Um, yeah, so it's called Virtual Pivot Point Suspension System. We ended up um, selling it uh, to a company called Santa Cruz, which is out of California, Santa Cruz, uh, California. And it's actively still the number one suspension system on the planet. Um, and the, the sort of, there's a million ways to skin this cat now, but where we were and sort of our claim to fame is, is we were the first ones to crack the code. So we took um, a very simple, where everyone, all the engineering teams out there trying to build better suspension bikes, literally almost 30 years ago, uh, we're trying to simplify, simplify, simplify. We added uh, very complex uh, interactions within the system that allowed you to actually get what you needed as a, as a rider. Um, so us cracking the code on that and figuring out that S path for the rear axle allows engineers uh, from all sorts of different bike companies now uh, to control and separate the rider's mass from the power that the rider produces. And it, that's sort of the key to having a mountain bike that doesn't sap all your energy when you're pedaling uphill. So I love we, it. yeah, it's really cool. We did that um, and it's amazing and we're super, super proud of it. Me and my partner, James, uh, back in the day with that. Um, but from there, I, I uh, ended up getting a job. Oakley came to me and said, hey, we want you to run a territory for us. Uh, they had just purchased back the rights for Oakley in Canada from a distributor, and I was one of their first agents, like a sales agent that they hired. Uh, moving into there, um, instantly, uh, I built an amazing sales agency, one agency of the year globally, one marketing agency of the year for Oakley globally. Um, and this was in the heyday, and we were making a fortune. It was amazing, but I got bored. So Oakley let me start tinkering with marketing and they let me start spe specifically tinkering inside their marketing. Yeah, nice. uh, and uh, my brain, even though it doesn't probably appear like it, I'm a very process driven human. And so when I dove into marketing and then specifically trade marketing within Oakley, I found all of these broken processes and the broken processes basically, um, 
were things that would just get cobbled together with all these bad solutions, Excel and, you know, spreadsheets and all this kind of garbage. Um, so, uh, they gave me a black box budget. I produced a custom system for them, ran their trade marketing through their heyday, through a custom sort of cobbled together thing that me and my partner, Greg built back in the day. Uh, and then, uh, a giant company bought them a company called Luxottica out of Italy. And they're right now it's called Luxottica Asler. I think they're an $80 billion a year company. Like they're massive. They do Ray-Ban. They own Sunglass Hut. They own the rights literally to almost every eyewear brand out on the market. Wow. Uh, and like they're monsters. And so we, uh, went to Milan, had a meeting because our software was a very, uh, original thing that Oakley had in its quiver and they wanted to understand what it was. So we went over, uh, had a conversation with them. Uh, the very unique solution we had designed for Oakley didn't fit into their business model. Like, you know, Oakley would want to do everything in a very specific, very North American way where sometimes the European marketplace operates a little different mm -hmm. with some of the nuances. So my partner and I left, we said, we looked at each other, we high-fived. We were like, we got an amazing concept. Let's go and make our own like really, really, really diverse and agnostic system that would work with any different business model. And that's, you know, seven, eight years ago when we sort of heated up and started building regulator as it's standalone. Uh, and here we are today. So that's fantastic. It's an awesome story. And I'd, I'd like to make a connection if, if I can, um, you were talking about how systems and processes were sort of scattered about and they weren't working and you had Excel on the one side and you had a system here and a solution there. And what it reminded me of was your cycling. And when you're in a race, the the fastest route is the most direct, the shortest route, you know, and picking your line and knowing where you're going is going to make the difference between you winning and losing. And it sounds like that's exactly what you did. You pick a line, You'd study the track, you know, the corners. Can you make that connection? A hundred percent. Yeah. Like I'm a firm believer that, um, you need to understand where you're going. If you don't understand where you're going, you're, you're doomed. Um, I would put this a little closer to, and I even see this in today's marketplace. Like I'll go into meetings, uh, like I'm dealing with a bunch of, uh, high end cosmetic companies this week is sort of on my plate to have conversations with these guys. And it's closer to the regulator or regulators a little closer to the virtual pivot point system is all these people have these very basic things in place, spreadsheets and, you know, a Dropbox account and more spreadsheets and they are ingesting information through email and they have this like very basic thing. They've got a sundial, right? And they can kind of tell the time, but like not super accurately and it's okay. Well, we know that inside my Apple watch, there's like a billion little things in here inside any great Rolex. There's a million little cogs and wheels that make things accurate and really good. Any software platform will be more complex than, in, than dealing with spreadsheets. Like just physically, like we have millions and millions and millions of lines of code that work specifically on direct process and to get to your point, to get to the end of this race and get there the fastest, get there the, you know, to be the fastest, you need to be the most efficient. That's, that's a given. Uh, but these, it, we have to add in complexity slightly. Um, and this, uh, to anybody is kind of a scary thing, but as I say to every CEO or CFO that I come across at some of these monster companies, uh, they go, all right, we're, everything we got sort of working fine right now. So I'm like, cool, that's great. I go, you guys use SAP or you use Oracle for your ERP? They go, of course, we use SAP. I'm like, great, cool. Let's turn SAP off and go back to paper books and Excel. What do you think? And they, they whoa, 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 like, or we would grind to a halt. I go, yeah, your business would literally stop today. If you turn that off, you're done. Not a single product's going to move. Nothing's going to happen. I go, you're just in paper books right now in your marketing department, trade marketing area, where you spend a ton of money, a ton, ton, ton of money. And that's where they're burning, you know, they're burning it out. Now, more VCs being involved with this 
um, and boards being more active within these companies and companies kind of getting aggregated into larger companies, they have to start being more dedicated to producing proper reporting to, to say where their marketing dollars are going. You can't just, uh, and I know this from the Oakley world, you know, James Stewart wins or, you know, let's go way back. Lance Armstrong wins uh, the tour. And before you know it, you got 30 bottles of champagne, a gold Rolex, uh, some really wacky custom gold plated glasses that cost $20,000. Uh, you've got 15 nights out in hotels. Like this is all marketing and trade marketing spend. And it's messy. I mean, like champagne at parties is like, a like, how do you actually like, you need to track this stuff. This is where... Yeah. This is where the big money gets sort of spent and lost. And then to go even further, this is a great story. This is one I use all the time. So Oakley at the time when Lance went bad, Oakley was the last company to punt Lance. End of story. And I know Lance, a nice guy. Oakley, Lance goes crazy, finally actually admits to everything. Oakley goes, ooh, we need out of the Lance business. Oakley had upwards of fifteen to 20,000 images of Lance in the market. Where were they? How much would it cost to get them out? How much would it cost then to put in replacement images? What's the net value of that? And when these are small little postcards or lances on something this size, it's not that expensive. But when you've got, you know, let's say, 2,000 storefront windows wrapped with Lance Armstrong, each window being approximately three to $4,000, and you've got to pay to take it down and then put something up because you promised the retailer marketing, there is huge money and infrastructure against that. Oakley came to us. We had a we had a distribution of exactly where all the Lance images are because that's what regulator does. Said, here's exactly how you can do it. Let's push this button. Anyone who was involved in distributing the Lance stuff got notification saying, hey, go get that Lance stuff out of market and replace it with this. And we had all the money, all the locations, and everything lined up. It's a really complex world. Now, modern examples of that are really simple. They're wild cards like Kanye. And like, what do you think Adidas had to pay when Kanye started going a little crazy and they've got all this Yeezy stuff out there? Like this, this is no idea. You know, uh, one of our companies is a hockey company called CCM, global leader, most premium hockey company out there. What happens when they've got a whole bunch of Russian athletes and window fronts all around North America that are great Russian athletes, but then their country decides to go and bomb out a smaller country and Russia is no longer in favor. This isn't a, just a Lance thing. This happened at Oakley with Oscar Pistorius, the guy with the spring legs who shot his girlfriend through the window and boy, oh boy, did we have to get a whole bunch of Oscar images out of market. This is our South African. I was very much um, involved with that case, and I yeah. remember that actually coming up. They had, you know, uh, at one stage there was a picture of him, you know, racing down the track, and it was the the caption on one of these big stores was something like "fastest bullet out of the gun," and this this was you know up there before you know the the incident, of course. So they had to quickly remove all of that. Yeah, and you're you're talking South Africa, which is a fairly small market when it comes to that stuff like 30x that in the united states of america mm -hmm. where consumerism is way higher and marketing is at a, at a at a higher tier it's super super tough to deal with and the complexities are mind-blowing and so a lot of like that's just the sort of nuts and bolts and you you've you know oakley you walk into a store you literally in manchester walk out go to a sporting goods store and see an oakley eyewear case absolutely right? you've seen those they're metal. There are, I don't know, a few hundred thousand of those in the marketplace right now, maybe more. Uh, yeah. And they need to know exactly where those are. Those are capital X, you know, CapEx costs for the brand. They need to understand where those are and they kind of have to track all that stuff. And most people don't. Brands don't manage these things right. So anyways, we get in and we meddle with that sort of stuff. And uh, it's, that's for everyone listening, that's what we do. Um, and work in that world and just make it so that brands stop wasting money because if they don't know where things are, that means they have to shotgun everything out to fix it, which is a nice. So I can imagine the, uh, you know, putting it into that 
perspective, that kind of scale. This is big work and um, I can just imagine what it would be like. I wouldn't trust myself after listening to you to invest in a person. <laughs> we too, we too um, what's the word? I'm like erratic. You know? I'd say, no, yeah. I'm not sponsoring anybody. <laughs> humans, humans are a lot of investment. Um, and to be honest, everything is like there's, it, it doesn't have to be as dramatic as a, you know, a guy shooting his girlfriend through the door like Oscar or Lance. Those are like really obvious or Kanye being strangely uh, off putting. Right. It, these are, those are like real edge cases. It's uh, in Canada where, where I'm based, we've got Quebec. Quebec is a French speaking part of Canada, but it doesn't speak Parisian French. It speaks Quebec French. There's nuances that make it different. Um, and that being said, Quebec in North America is probably the second largest consumer based population outside of California. It's that big of a, a territory with that many people and their consumerism, especially in the sporting goods world and sort of outdoor world is voracious. So it's a massive marketplace. Um, and brands put crazy translations into market all the time crazy like the you know you'll have a outdoor brand put something up that says you know your your grandma eats snowballs and smokes turkeys like and it's supposed to say your grandma wears a, a down jacket from you know this company and they they just get it wrong and the quebec people um there's actually french police language police that run around to make sure that everything is translated into french because they're very protective of their um of their culture, which to be honest, I a thousand percent agree with. It's a beautiful culture. They should protect it. Um, but it's challenging. So it could just be a spelling error. And we've all seen those ads put out in market. And you're like, I can't believe that, you know, X Nike, Adidas, someone put something in market and there's a spelling mistake in it. And you're like, there's how, you know, like it's crazy. So you wonder how that slipped through. And he's yeah, actually, like, somebody's noticed this somewhere along the line. Somebody must have noticed. <laughs> yeah, cre so the funny, <laughs> creative brains, uh, and I'm a creative brain, um, we look at things for form and structure and prettiness where I literally won't le read the copy or if I do read the copy, there could be a thousand typos in it and I just sort of blow through them because I'm worried about the overall composition. Creative yeah. people that have to launch creative in the market are literally the exact wrong people to copy check stuff, which is kind of <laughs> a hilarious thing, but it's the reality of it. And because we use slightly different uh, functions in our brain than a copywriter ever would. We're not technically built that way. That's so, true. yeah, I anyways, um, the complexities can be massive. The spend, um, so in general... Uh, a large company would spend anywhere from four to 17, 18% of their gross on marketing slash trade marketing. And the bigger the company with the simpler, the product, the generally the higher that percentage. So like Red Bull, uh, sending people into upper atmosphere in space capsules and throwing them out with parachutes. That's a really expensive thing. Like their yeah. product is quite affordable, quite cheap to make. Uh, it's sugar water. It's great, but they, uh, their marketing spend is inordinately high and that all needs to be tracked. And yeah. so and we, we all know examples of these things. So that's it. And well, look, I mean, at the end of the day, there's not many people and it. It's working for them. I think there's not many people that if you say, you know, Red Bull that they know, I've watched the racing, the skydiving, these guys that are working with these parasailing things that are cruising around mountains and um, flying through rock crevices. I mean, that stuff is just absolute eye candy for me. The names plastered over everything. I love it. <laughs> I love it. I love watching them. I always like to find out about where people started and not necessarily the business, but as a person, you, you were a professional athlete. You're just spending a lot of time cycling when you were in school, in university, um, in studies, whatever it was. Did you know one day I want to be a businessman? I want to run this. This is what I want to do. Were you taken by surprise? Tell me a little bit about your growth. I come, um, so I come from a, like my father's a 
a high school teacher and my mom was a stay at home mom and just sort of worked odd jobs to help pay the bills. Um, I literally went to high school in the downtown Calgary, which is a city of about, you know, 1.3 million people, 1.4. Um, and I was in, you know, very first sort of years of high school education and, or days. And I went and I got a job immediately, uh, at a bicycle store down the street. And I'm like, Hey, I, I went back and my dad happened to be a teacher at that same school that I was going to high school. And he's like, do you need a ride home? I go, no, I got a job tonight. I, I'm working. I got a job. And he's like, are you kidding me? And I'm like, no, and he's like, <laughs> maybe I should come home and see this. So I, I started working early because I wanted, uh, to afford to have bikes. It was a really simple goal. Like it's a kid's goal, right? Yeah. Um, and really the end of it, it, it's never changed. I just want more bikes and I want mm -hmm. like a better truck to move the bikes. And then well, I wanted a ranch and, I, and the, the, you know, I've got a beautiful wife that I want to support and a lifestyle that's amazing and all these different things. It was really, really simple formula. I was an athlete. I was super driven. I wasn't the best athlete, but I was crafty. Um, and being crafty meant that I had to think my way around it. I couldn't just physically do it. I was never the strongest and fittest guy, but I won a ton of bike races because I could kind of play the field and get into the mental aspects of it and understand people have uh, very definitive areas where they crack. Um, and so I started my own companies all the way through, uh, bike racing because I couldn't really hold proper jobs. So I was doing all sorts of random little companies that I'd build and I loved, it was the same thing. I could come up with an idea, go sell it to people, whether it was having a company that went around to all the different snowboard shops and get all their really, really, uh, broken snowboards that needed complex repairs that the stores weren't good enough to do. And I would do that. And I had the skill set to do that from sort of working in these athletic stores all the way through. So there was just all these like weird little makeshifty things. And then being a professional cyclist isn't like being a professional soccer player or football player. Um, you don't have that money. You've got to hustle. Like you literally have to have odd jobs. Like you get paid my last couple of years of cycling. I got actually money. The rest of it, it was up to me to run my way through. I was, you know, a mid tier pro that kind of had to pay his own way. Um, and that's just the reality of it. So just a grind. Those, uh, yes. carbon fiber components weren't, weren't cheap when they started coming out. <laughs> Thankfully I was good enough to get bikes for free. Um, uh, but I, a lot of, you know, like even if I got free, you know, tickets to the race and the race is paid for and stuff, there's still food and hotels that like, and, and beyond that, there's, you know, four months in California when I'm in Canada, when it's snowing here, I need to be somewhere warm where I can actually work on my fitness outside and do these. Things. So those things are all quite expensive. So yeah, I wasn't, um, I, I, I hold no, uh, special skills. I was a terrible student, terrible. Um, and I was, you know, like I hold no, uh, veils up against that it, it wasn't my specialty like i got through it when when i i podiumed as a pro uh in canada at the canadian national championships got my awards dropped the mic and went and started doing bicycle design because i was like the bike i was on which was from a company called gt sucked it was so bad i kept breaking them suspension was terrible i could be way faster if it was just better uh, and I've got a fairly good natural grasp of Newtonian physics that, you know, that sort of basic level of physics, which is levers and friction and like the very basic upper sort of level of really simple physics. And I got a really good natural grasp of that. I can't do the math, uh, for it, but I understand it really, really well. So yeah, we just, I just sort of moved through that and then somehow develop some sort of level of process skill and obviously understand marketing good enough. And I think that's just a natural thing. Like it just, we all, most people, if they turn their mind to it, uh, can understand marketing. It's not that tricky human. Yeah. You just have to study human nature. As you mentioned, you, you help rescue animals before we started speaking. You, you, you do some animal rescue and stuff. You don't have to be a gorilla or a monkey or a lower primate to understand them 
you just need to look at them, watch them, understand their motions, understand their patterns and start, you start to figure these things out. Like of course a PhD would help. However, just about everyone who's interested could get to the basics pretty quick. Uh, and I am, uh, I did it with mountain bike, the mountain bike convention. I've done it with a few other things. A single person can come up with an amazing thing that changes the planet. Does. Absolutely. Like, uh, you know, look at Taylor Swift. She's in, it's insane. She's like tearing North America apart, making billions and billions of dollars. People are fighting for tickets to one little woman that's super talented that goes on stage for three hours and sings yeah. her songs. She, if she can make that impact, just about anyone, as long as you put your mind to it, you can do a really good, you can be an impactful human. Most people are just lazy though. Taylor's not that's lazy. It. Yeah. So I think, I think you've touched on something very important there. And I think, um, drive and ambition, one of the, the, the big factors here, um, and now obviously I'm sure you know the same. I've met a lot of people that have studied and been in universities for 15 years and built successful companies. I know people that have dropped out of high school and built successful companies, but the, I'd say that one or two, two things that are, are um, common is drive and the people that they surround themselves with. That's something that people talk about a lot. And it's always a good partner, a good team, a good um, life partner even. Sometimes it's not a business partner, but a partner at home that is is the driving force or the motivation, the, the thing that keeps people going. Can you tell me about some of the people around you? Yeah. So first off, the most important person in my life is my beautiful wife, Harper, who is, you would understand what this is, is a king, King's Council litigator. So yeah. um, King's Council for people that don't understand, for a lawyer, it's kind of like winning. It doesn't do much for you. Um, it, back in the day, it meant that in any of the small territories uh, that England sort of had in its kingdom, uh, they would handpick certain lawyers that are the best of the best so that if the queen or the king gets in trouble, they know exactly who to go to that is the best and they would protect them and they're just sort of the marquee people. Uh, my wife being, you know, nowadays it's kind of like, you know, winning an Academy Award. You know, about 1% or 2% of all lawyers in the Commonwealth ever get this designation and you're the top of the top. So my wife is, uh, she, as I call her, she's a tiger shark. She's like, she's super smart. She's super pretty. She's deadly. You don't want to get in an argument with her. She's like an alpha predator as a human. She's insane. Um, and that's my wife. She's, she's amazing. Uh, my friends, you know, my partners, Greg and, uh, brand regulator and Mark and 54 blue. They're two of the most outstanding people I know. My staff are amazing. Um, and I tend to, um, surround ourselves and we come out of a really unique group in Calgary, which is kind of odd. Uh, just about every single pro snowboarder, you know, has milled through our, my circle somewhere, which is a really random thing. Most of the pro mountain bikers, I'm one or two degrees from, I, you know, have had many conversations with uh, Lance Armstrong. I know all these very strange humans. Uh, a couple of my best friends, you, you guys would know there's a, a bag accessory company called Herschel Supply Co, uh, which knits oh. backpacks and all these things that are literally, it's a global brand. Well, those are two of my best friends that came out of Calgary and started this thing. Uh, one of my other friends is the CMO of a mega, mega company that owns tons of other brands. They own the bulk of the surf industry now, as far as brands. And like, we're sort of in this group of really high performing humans. And if you surround yourself with drug addicted, um, alcoholic, uh, people who lay about and don't do much, well, chances are you're not going to do a lot either. And if you surround yourself with quality humans, not even people that are like the level of success doesn't matter, but grinders, you know, one of my best friends is owns his own company that puts in septic systems and stuff in rural properties. Right. And it's not a glamorous business, but he is a grinder and he's so impressive. My friend, Mike, that he just like, he he'll you call him at any point and he's 
super accurate. He's working. He's like, it, it's super inspirational person. So the, the humans that you surround yourselves with are super important. And again, I am extra lucky. And I would assume some people believe that I probably take advantage of my access, but you know, the CMO of Oakley, Scott Bowers through the heyday is a friend. And that's like having the CMO of Nike as your friend. Like it, that's like a, he's a super impressive human. And of course I will access him for reading and testing and looking at my articles. And like, of course, of course. Of course. like I would be a fool not to. Yeah. <laughs> to Here I have an expert in the field and I, what I'm going to do is not ask them for advice. Like <laughs> a, a thousand percent. And I just, you know, like I know, um, I just posted a, a podcast with a friend of mine. It just went live. Joe Prebish, who was the, um, team manager for snowboard for Red Bull and specifically Sean White's team manager through Sean White's giant heyday of a career. And of course I, I'm going to talk to my friend Joe and interview him and get all and extract as much advice out of this guy. Cause not only can everyone else learn, but hell I learn like there's so much that this human has done that it, it's wild. So yeah. I, I can't, um, I I've surrounded myself with ultra high performing a types. Sometimes they're annoying, but I'm more annoying than all of them. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'm going to ask you just a couple, uh, little ones for us to finish off. I know you got some things to do. Um, I'll ask everybody this. If we have to put a slogan above your bed, couple words. A mantra, a motto to live by. You got to look at it, wake up, look at it every day. What does it say? Never stop. Nice. I like that. It's, literally on, it's uh, literally on the head tube of my mountain bike. So when I look down, it says never stop. I like it's that. All sorts of times when I'm climbing for two hours up a giant mountain that I want to stop. It doesn't take much to not stop. I just look down, I see it, and I go, all right. Yeah, carry on. Stop. Yeah. I like that. Um, my best mates and I, um, you know, being, we, we were trick bikers back in the day and, and, you know, t silly teenagers, um, we used to take, um, one of those compasses and we'd actually scratch it into our wrist. We said, no fear before we were dropping down roofs and things, you know, 12 foot high roofs onto grass embankments, breaking ankles and, <laughs> and oh, we should have run to stand be dumb. But anyways, it, it, it worked. And then um, a last one for you then, a role model, anybody that you look up to. Now, you've mentioned some some people that have been inspirations. Um, people from around the world will be familiar with the names and the companies and the um, the people that you've met. But if I said to you, who's, who's the one that you can look up to? Do you have one? I have so many. I, I am voracious at, again, extracting what I can get out of humans and understanding, you know, sort of the good and the bad. And I get as much out of terrible people as I get out of great people. So as a pure role model, no, the, I guess the answer is unfortunately no. However, the answer is literally everybody, which is a, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a cop out and I know it, but I, my, my wife, my five or six, you know, I've got, uh, my wife, I've got my best friend that I ride with, uh, I ride mountain bikes with literally three or four times a week when I'm not broken into pieces, Brad, and he is literally one of the nicest humans I ever met. And he is a, my role model. And so it was, you know, my nephew who's super inspirational in what he does and all these different humans. And yeah, so I, I have definitely not pinned it down to a single one. Taylor Swift. She's amazing. You know, yeah. Bob, he's amazing. There's so many people that are absolutely amazing. And even unfortunately, some very despicable people, um, have some very amazing characteristics. Like I, I was going to do an art piece at one point and I, I didn't do it, but it was a giant wall project at a, at a sporting facility. And in the middle was a Lance Jersey and there was a button that said hero or villain. And there was spread out on 50 feet of wall on either side was, you know, donated 
you know, helped raise hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions for cancer, got most of North America off their ass and off the couch to ride bikes, you know, you know, on and on and on father, all these different things that Lance is great. Like that is just like that. He was beyond exceptional at like no one has made more impact than Lance and Livestrong in the cancer world still to this day. Yeah. Uh, but on the other side, there was just about as much bad stuff, liar, cheater, uh, abuse, you know, like he was a, not abuse of to people, but he was an abusive human to other people, you know, with his behavior. And I don't think Lance would argue that, you know, he was a bully. He was all these different things and the ballots on net, it's kind of tough to say where that guy falls. Right. And if you dig under the cover for all, a lot of these athletes, well, they're not all really nice people, right? Like there's lots of stories of lots of footballers and there's lots of stories about lots of professional hockey players or American football players or yeah. bad action. You know, Tiger Woods. Tiger, a good guy? Mm, today he is, yeah. right? Hey. So I, I don't know. But that being said, I think we all live on balance and um, I'm not perfect and I do tons of terrible things. I try to avoid despicable things. Uh, but you know, decisions, uh, that might be good for me might be bad for someone else. I've seen this from large and, and it's tough. Like I can't, def you know, how do I get mad at a company that has to cut 30 or 40% of their labor force? And it might affect me when, uh, I need to switch from engineering and regulator to sales. And I've got to cut 30% of my developers to be uh, a break-even company, you know, years ago, it's the same decision. It's just a smaller scope, fortunately, but it's literally the exact same decision. So anyways, uh, long answer. I think everyone's super inspiring. Because I like that finding, finding good things in people. And like you say, it depends on how we're being judged, isn't it? Um, whether the good that we've done outweighs the bad. And in some cases, people will say, well, no, no, it's, it's great that you raised billions of dollars for cancer, but you lied to us about the substance. So how do you erase that with that? How much is that actually worth? And, you know, it's a difficult thing. But, yeah, if you can look through that, if you can look through all of that and, and pull out the good, pull out the genuine, the good, the the hard work. And I know that it's it's... It's tough in business and in sport and to maintain the whole time the pressures that are on the back of people the whole time to support yourselves, your families, the people that work for you, the fans that support you, the companies that are looking after you, the managers that are pushing you further. And it's a it's it's not surprising that people crack. <laughs> It's not. And it's funny, I had a conversation with someone really dear to me the other day, just trying to impart some life lessons on them. And I go, the pro I trust everyone when the chips are down and there's a real serious problem, a health problem or like a dire economic thing. I trust almost like 99% of the people's decision making when it's like super serious. Where everyone in life fails is when fun is involved. So <laughs> it's human. when you mentioned when you're like, we would jump, we would do this. We'd scratch no fear in our hand. We should have put, don't, you know, don't do it. Um, the, 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 the mitigating issue in that is fun. So alcoholism comes from fun. Drug abuse generally comes from fun. Uh, bad people you hang out with while well, bad people are traditionally pretty damn fun. Right. Uh, the, uh, relationship you're going to have outside of your wife probably super fun to start with yeah all when when fun is the balance point humans have a really hard time stopping it because of the dopamine hit from fun and it's a non-controllable gut reaction and so i don't trust people when it comes in those to those decisions and fun is at the root of making money which is a really really slippery thing in business because fun leads to being able to buy helicopters and like go on giant amazing trips and like like yeah. it, it literally hits if you follow the chain all the way through that's yeah. where it is and of that's a real problem so anyways uh mo but in general uh there's something good in just about everyone a few people maybe not but most people <laughs> if we look hard enough we'll find a bit 
Um, and Jamie, like I said, I'm I'm gonna let you go. I know you got things to do. I just want to say thank you so much. Um, you got an awesome attitude, really cool personality, easy to speak to. Thank you for your time. Is there anything you want to leave our listeners with before we go? Uh, no, go to brandregulator.com. Check out our product. Uh, it's the only thing that does what it does in the marketplace. So if you're a brand out there and you are struggling controlling your marketing, come have a chat with me. Uh, I'd love to get you a license and actually help fix and stop you wasting money and time. Other than that, uh, enjoy the summer. That's, uh, that's the best thing. I've we'll see. We're at the tail end. Oh, fantastic. Thank you, Jamie. We'll see you around. Thank you, Matt. Really appreciate it.